Well, thank you everyone for joining us for the latest in the Miller Knoll Insight Series online. It's great to have you with us. Uh, my name is Mark Catchlove and I work for Miller Knoll and lead the Insight Group. If you don't know Miller Knoll, we are a family of brands, all of which you can see in front of you. And we design and manufacture products that support people where they live, where they are healed, where they learn and where they work. And today we are going to be focusing on places and organizations in work. And I'm really pleased to say that today's guest is John Ingham. John uh, provides consulting and training in innovative people management and organization design through the Strategic HR Academy. It's his own organization. He's also an author of a book called The Social Organization, HR and uh, Operational, sorry, Organizational Development Book with a full chapter on workplace design. And he's frequently identified as a top HR influencer. John is based in the UK, as you've heard, but does work globally. We're looking forward to a great session. Please use the chat box for questions and observations as we go along. And I will put them to John at the end of the session. John, over to you. Looking for a great session. Thank you very much, Mark. Uh, great to be here. Uh, I've enjoyed lots of these webinars in the past and uh, wonderful to be part of the series. Uh, so, yes, so I am a, a strategic HR consultant and trainer. Um, uh, as, um, so strategic HR, uh, strategic HCM even is probably the the sort of brand that I'm most associated with. Uh, so strategic human capital management. Uh, I probably use that a little less these days as uh, uh, the term human capital has never been particularly loved and has become even more tarnished over the last couple of decades. Um, but I do still talk about human capital as the value uh, that organisations can create in their people, which is which can be useful for the business. Uh, so HCM for me is still a, um, a, a progressive, empowering type of term, uh, even if that's not necessarily how it's uh, perceived. Um, so, you know, I'm interested in things like talent interaction, employer branding, engagement, and so on, all things which the uh, physical workplace can absolutely impact. And therefore I've had a long, uh, a long-term interest in workplace design. Uh, actually, the other reason is probably that I've worked in some really dispiriting offices uh, that I never wanted to, to ever go back to. So, um, you know, the, the workplace can absolutely um, link with HR to provide the type of organisation that we're trying to build, uh, and the opposite is certainly true as well. Um, so I'm really pleased that over the last couple of decades, there has, has been an increasing amount of integration between HR and workplace design. Um, but there is this other piece around organisation design, uh, which I've focused on uh, throughout my career, but probably pay more and more attention to these days. Uh, again, because I focus on strategic HR, uh, increasing the, the impact uh, of what we do around people. Uh, having a direct impact on competitive advantage by having the best people uh, and developing them and looking after them and motivating them and so on. Uh, and the way we organise people uh, is, a, is a really good way of having that sort of impact. Uh, so I spend a lot of time in organisation design. And actually, although workplace design and HR are very closely or should be very closely uh, related, I think the links between organisation design and workplace design are even closer and should be recognised and made closer in many organisations than they currently are. Um, so that's really sort of the key focus of this session. Um, I do need to say, so my focus around workplace design is very much looking after the workforce. Uh, obviously the workplace has a, a, an additional purpose in supporting clients and visitors and all of those other things which is a little bit different to all of the other things in the organisation. Um, so I, I, I don't really sort of look at that side of things. Uh, but in terms of HR, organisation design, workplace design, uh, wrote about all of those in the book that Mark mentioned, The Social Organisation, uh, published in 2017, uh, but still very, um, uh, very topical for today. 
uh, clearly a lot of things have changed. Uh, and in fact, the, the, as well as those three areas, the book's main focus is around social capital. So I've, I've already introduced human capital. Social capital is the value of the connections, the relationships, the conversations taking place between people in an organization. Um, so it's the way that people work together in teams, communities and networks, which for me are even more important than the value of the human capital itself. Um, and it's been really interesting going through the pandemic since the book and um, seeing the way that the, the social capital has been impacted, uh, mainly uh, negatively, uh, although um, you, you, the, the, the strong ties with people that you work with on a very close basis have probably um, developed further during the pandemic, uh, particularly when we were working remotely because people needed to put more focus in that area. Uh, but the, 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 the weak ties, uh, the, the people that we you know, used to bump into wherever it would be, um, you know, the water cooler thing, um, those definitely deteriorated. But they have sort of come back uh, to a large extent in most organisations today. Um, so I wanted in this session to take you through four main insights that I've always considered to be particularly important in doing organisation design, and I think they apply to workplace design as well. Uh, before I do that, however, I just wanted to uh, recognise and reflect on the way that everything has changed you know, before, during, post the pandemic. Uh, again, I don't think the pandemic has really changed that much in many ways. You know, we are sort of back to largely back to sort of where we were, obviously with more hybrid working, more use of digital technology, perhaps a little bit more people centricity in may, may, may many organizations as well. Uh, but in the main, it has been that thing about sort of accelerating us towards the future, which often leads people to say rather strange things like, you know, the future is now and which, which I, you know, I, I, I don't think is, is true. Yeah, the future is still out there. It's just, it's sort of even uh, uh, more different to now than it, was in the past, if that makes sense. Um, so I do think it's digital transformation, which is the biggest shift, uh, which is causing everything to change around us. Uh, and that applies both in terms of digital business. So the shifts towards focusing more on customers. I can't always tell that's the case, but again, you know, that's something that many businesses are trying to do. Uh, the use of new business models, uh, working together with other companies and ecosystems and so on. And you do see very similar shifts in terms of the workforce, you know, with people uh, seeking to self actualize uh, more than perhaps we did in the past. And I don't think that's just a sort of Generation Y, Generation Z thing. I think that's uh, very common across uh, different people in the workplace. Uh, different contract types, uh, you know, a lot of focus on uh, using skills outside jobs at the moment. Uh, so gigs, side hustles and so on. And the organisation very much at the centre of those. And indeed, as I'll talk more about shortly, I think increasingly the organisation does need to deliver both for the business, but also for employees in the workforce. And um, so there is this shift, I think, towards seeing employees more as real customers of the organisation. Uh, in fact, that's something I'm writing a lot about in LinkedIn at the moment, where my latest newsletter is on multi-sided multi HR or the need to be both strategic and people-centric at the same time. Um, so in the middle of all these shifts, uh, the digital organisation is, I think, has to be as a consequence of those two other um, trends towards getting closer to employees, being more people-centric, emphasising personalisation, um, identifying, developing, implementing new organisation models. We don't just need to organise in the way that we have done for the last few decades, uh, there's a lot more opportunity now. And in particular, at the centre of that, uh, creating and enabling people to work in a much more networked way. Um, organisations today are not or should not be the same type of organisations that they were in the 2000s or before. Uh, but I think a lot of organisations are, you know, there, there's still a, a, a lot more that we need to do which will impact um, the workplace as we go through that. So uh, onto these four insights that I wanted to share with you. 
Uh, and the first is, um, to, to me, the sort of the, the golden rule of, of, of organization design. Um, the organizations are only ever effective when they're coherent, you know, when the different aspects, different elements of an organization uh, align with and support each other and therefore sort of create a type of organization that we want to produce. Uh, which is why one of the most fundamental tools in an organization designer's toolkit uh, is an organization model, a representation of the organization they're working with, so they can just sort of think through um, or, or at least just check that they've sort of not missed anything in their uh, design activities. Uh, so you've got tools like J. Galbraith's STAR, uh, the McKinsey 7S model, and so on. But all of those models really are several decades old. They don't really reflect the way that organizations work today. And so I quite often use the model on the right, which is my um, sort of equivalent of the, or build on the McKinsey 7S, so a 10S model, uh, including social relationships because of the importance of social capital, which I've already talked about, uh, but also the physical and the digital workspaces. You know, I, I, I just don't understand uh, in today's world, how organization designers can ignore the workplace. You know, it's, it's such a big uh, and, and possible, possibly in terms of things like employee branding, the most physical manifestation of um, uh, the organization. So you know, we do need to include workplace design as part of organization design. Uh, workplace designers, practitioners, you, know, you need to talk to your organization design colleagues. Uh, to ensure that that alignment and coherence is there, um, and organisation design. You know, the, the, the organisation design practitioners need to be talking to you uh, to ensure that the workplace is part of the, the broader organisation that they're trying to build. Uh, it doesn't mean that OD or HR practitioners need to um, you know, um, sort of take responsibility for the colour of the chairs or anything. Um, but they need to ensure that all of those items that we use in the workplace um, you know, fit in terms of the, the type of organisation that we're trying to build. Um, I do uh, also I have my own model, which I call the organisation prioritisation model. Uh, it's, um, uh, yeah, it's not really um, <laughs> sort of taken hold very much. I, mean, I use it, but I don't know anybody else who does. Um, uh, so you know, if, if you want to think about an organization model for your own uh, organization, I would use the seven or the 10S or the star model. Um, but this to me is, is more representative. It's more true about uh, how an organization really works. Um, so I talk about the core elements, uh, which are the most important aspects of organization uh, that designers really need to focus on first. Uh, so that's the work that needs to get done, the infrastructure, uh, all the technology, data, buildings, and um, the sort of hard, tangible aspects of organization, uh, the people, uh, but again, also those social connections. So before we do anything else, we should have a good feel uh, for what we're trying to develop within those core elements. Uh, but then the second row is the, the various organization enablers which support that. So you've got the work styles in terms of sort of the use of flexible working and so on. Um, but then, yes, the, the physical workplace and the digital workspace um, you know, really important aspects of organisation that we need to attend to really before we get into the uh, sort of the HR and reward aspects of organisations uh, and things like the roles and groups and uh, reporting relationships and so on, or, or the structure of the organisation, you know, which is the thing that tends to be what everyone focuses on, but really doesn't make very much difference to an organisation. Um, uh, uh, you know, the, compared to things like the, the core elements or indeed uh, the, the physical workplace. Um, so uh, I, I, I include that slide because I'm going to come back and talk more about those core elements uh, and how they can help us in a few minutes. Uh, but yes, the, the, the fundamental um, insight that I've shared with you so far let's make our organizations coherent because otherwise we're, we're not going to get um, the, the sort of results that we want to achieve. Uh, the second insight is that we also need vertical alignment. Uh, we need alignment between what we do in the organization and what the business needs, or at least that's what I used to say uh, these days because of the increasing uh, people centricity in many organizations, 
the need to treat employees as customers, uh, actually we need to do much more than that. We need that vertical alignment with the business strategy, but we also need alignment with the needs of our workforce. Um, you can think about that in terms of the culture of the organization uh, or the experience of employees in the organization. Uh, but actually, I think meeting employee needs is much more than employee experience, or at least the way that experience is often perceived. Uh, because I don't think most employees come to work for the experience of work. You know, that's important, but they come to work to achieve something. And obviously, part of that is pay, but there's, you know, there are other things as well often uh, quite unique idiosyncratic uh, needs that mean that's why they're uh, in employment with you. And if we can try to identify what those things are, we can also uh, start to meet them more effectively. So on the left-hand side of this matrix, uh, those are the, the sort of the two uh, main objectives that we need to try and meet in terms of what the organization needs to deliver for the business and for employees. You know, we need to uh, provide organization capability. Uh, that's the human and the social capital that I talked about before, but also the organization capital, the value of the organization itself directly for the business, not in terms of how the organization uh, and, and the workplace uh, enable human capital, which they do. You know, a, 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 a good workplace is going to make it easier for us to. Uh, to attract and retain the talent that we need. So there's a there's a link between workplace design, organization design, and human capital. Uh, there's a link to social capital, um, you know, a good, effective workplace uh, that's got different types of meeting rooms and restaurants and um, enables interaction in lots of different ways will have a much bigger impact on social capital than one where we all go and lock ourselves away in offices and cub cubicles and, you know, don't ever talk to anybody. Um, but then the organization capital itself, you know, your, your, your organization, your workplace may enable people to do things differently that your competitors don't allow their employees to do. So that's a, a direct impact on competitive advantage, maybe simply by creating organization capital through the organization or the workplace. Um, so that link to organization capital, I think, is the most direct benefit of workplace design or organization design. Um, but yeah, for me, it's the social capital piece, which is the most impactful. Um, yeah, that, that's where the real opportunity lies. If you can create an environment that everybody wants to work together effectively in the way that they need to work together, uh, and the organization and the workplace are aligned behind that. That's the biggest win. Um, partly because I think that's the, the weakest area in many organizations today, you know, that, so you've, you've got. Um, both the sort of high opportunity and the low level of current development. Um, over on the right hand side of the matrix uh, is how the organization should work in achieving the objectives over on the, the left. Um, so the capabilities and the culture is what the organization needs to provide. Uh, the uh, organization principles and value is, is, is how the organization should work. Um, so principles are quite like values. So values we all know they're the um, the the the, um, the intents that we want to under um, underlie people's behaviour. And so yeah, we need to communicate those to everybody so that they behave in a particular way. So it's the values that everybody sort of knows about inside an organisation. Uh, the principles are more for management decision making. So they don't necessarily need to be communicated in the same way. Um, uh, but they they should exist uh, to and, and, and to be there for HR, OD, workplace design, uh, business leaders who are making decisions about the organisation, and they should be specific enough to influence the decisions which are made and the actions which are taken. Um, so lots of organisations don't have principles. Uh, I don't know how they do. If, I, well, I don't think they can do effective design if they don't have principles. Um, and lots of organizations have principles which are so wishy-washy that they don't mean anything anyway. They're, they're not going to influence any action uh, and they're not really any better. Um, so the values and principles need to be quite closely related, but the, uh, the values do need to be quite broad because they need to act in uh, various situations, whereas the principles do need to be very specific. 
Um, so if you can put those together, if you've got a good feel for the workforce needs, the organization capabilities, the principles and the values, you've got a really good basis to design an organization that meets those, uh, that creates this vertical alignment, uh, and you're not just yeah, relying on best practice, which is what too many organizations do. Uh, organization effectiveness is about best fit, not best practice. It's about alignment with what we need to provide. Um, particularly when you're thinking about organizations or workplaces from a strategic level, you know, just in terms of all the operational stuff, um, uh, the, the layers in, in an organization or the toilets in the workplace, uh, best practice is fine for that. You know, I, I, I wouldn't even know where to begin trying to design a best fit toilet. Uh, um, so that, you know, they, they need, they need to work, they need to be clean. Um, uh, they're important, but it's not where we want to spend our time. As you shift away from those and you, you focus on the things which are, are more meaningful for people, um, they've got to be best fit. If, if, if you're just doing uh, best practice, you're doing the same as all your competitors and local organizations. Um, yeah, I mean, that's, that's, that's better than not using best practice. Uh, but it's not, it's not going to help you compete against all of those other organizations, either in terms of the business or uh, for uh, the workforce, either. Uh, so, uh, yes, and then, and then sorry, I, I was just going to say as well, uh, I think that reliance on best practice, I mean, you can see in things like hybrid working, you know, the, the way that all organizations today are sort of coming to a conclusion of we need to ask our people in two days a week yeah <laughs> well that's good um but it's not it's not an optimal solution it's not in, in well in most places it's not something that's been thought through for a particular organization uh, we're just using it because everybody else uses it and that's sort of what employees expect because everyone is doing it whereas actually there are potentially ways uh, to think that through a bit more deeply and smartly uh, which I'll have a look at in a few minutes. Uh, so insight three uh, is the yes, we need to think about organizational needs as an organization, and we need to think about individual needs for individual employees, but we really need to think about the different groups and networks within inside an organization as well. Um, I mean, organization design is fundamentally about grouping people together. Um, you know, so these people are sort of organized together, uh, to work together, and, and they're therefore a little bit separate from those people over there. Um, so organizations, the, the, the organization design, the organization architecture in organizations quite often gets criticized for being siloed. Um, and, and, and silos aren't, uh, they're not positive things, and, and we should be able to avoid them by smart organization design. Uh, but actually, OD fundamentally is about grouping people so they can do things together. And, and, and by grouping people, you're also separating people. You know, there's a there's natural um, link between those two things. Um, but it's, it's, it's bringing people together around the right things, the things which are important in today's digitally transformed world. Uh, so these are the four, well, so sorry, so the, the top line here, uh, the core elements, the connections, the people, the infrastructure, the work that we talked about before. Uh, the bottom line is my suggestion of the four main organization forms uh, which we can use and build on and combine uh, in different ways. Uh, so third over towards the right, uh, functions, divisions was the, the traditional way of uh, designing organizations. Um, and, and a lot of organization designers, I must say, still think in those terms, you know, the, uh, um, there's a, 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 a fairly recently published book uh, um, by uh, senior consultants at an OD consultancy firm, Kate's Kessler, uh, which is probably the sort of best well recognized uh, OD consultancy, uh, because the founders used to work with Jay Galbraith, who was sort of the big uh, guru in this space, uh, who developed the star model and so on. Um, and their book suggests actually, yes, things have changed, but you've still really only got these three uh, main traditional organization forms, which are functions, divisions, and matrices. And, and then you can sort of do things on top of that. I mean, if you look, <laughs> if you look broadly at what's happening in organizations, and particularly, uh, you know, a lot of modern organizations that 
everybody writes about. Yeah, we, we do tend to use the same case studies, uh, albeit that the number of case studies are, are growing uh, slowly over time. Um, so I'm thinking, well, yeah, in my book, I, 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 I talk about uh, organisations which operate differently. Uh, Frederick Laloux, Reinventing Organisations, Corporate Rebels, Gary Hamill, Humanocracy, and so on. You know, there's a number of books around, and, and we'll provide you those uh, references. Um, that, 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 that simply do not operate as functions, divisions, or matrices. So there, there are alternatives, there are options, and there need to be alternatives. You know, we, we've already had a look at that when we talked about digital transformation. Uh, Organisations should be different to how they were in the past. Uh, so, yes, yeah, so, uh, uh, functions, I mean, uh, uh, functions haven't gone away. You know, there, there's a lot of fluff in social media about the end of hierarchies. Complete nonsense. Um, hierarchies work for a lot of what we need to do. They're not going to disappear, um, but we can certainly add to them as well. Uh, so over on the far right, uh, the use of horizontal teams. Um, so teams working, focusing on a, a particular cross-functional objective, a, a customer need or a business objective or a particular problem in the organisation uh, and, and, and working in a horizontal cross-functional way. Uh, and those teams could be product teams, process teams, project teams, agile teams. You know, there's lots of different ways of organising within that category. Uh, but fundamentally, more than anything else, they're all horizontal. Um, and then you've got communities and distributed networks. Um, uh, so uh, distributed networks, you know, where there isn't really any centre of an organisation anymore, uh, but people are doing what they need to do locally uh, and taking responsibility and leading uh, the people around them. Um, the, the, you know, there are there's a lot. Well, there are organisations that do organise, do operate as networks. Uh, WL Gore, Morning Star are examples. Uh, but there are great examples of big traditional organisations that use networks very powerfully with inside their organisation now as well. Uh, GE, General Electric, is probably my favourite example. Uh, the you know still very much a command and control oriented organisation, but uses uh, knowledge networks as the basis for problem solving, in addition to a lot of their um, the existing functions and divisions and project teams and programmes and all of the other stuff that they've got. Uh, communities smaller than the networks, um, so uh, a, a lower number of employees than the Dunbar number, so sort of less than 50 or 150, so that everybody knows each other uh, and they can sort of focus uh, internally and support each other and, and uh, sort of work together in a very deep sort of way. So to me, you've got those four major organisation forms, uh, which leads to four different work styles as well. Um, so coordination in functions, you know, people in functions tend to work mostly independently. Uh, we tend to call the people working for a manager in a hierarchical function, a team, but they're not really. They're just lots of people doing individual things who sort of have to uh, coordinate their work and come together now and again. Um, but there's a real distinction between that and horizontal teams uh, yeah, where team members really do have to collaborate, to work together, to produce something uh, and where the team objectives are more important than the individual ones. Uh, communities is where you can really develop uh, the sort of cultivation of relationships. Uh, I think we could do a lot more in, uh, in, in communities, both online and uh, in person than we do. Uh, and distributed networks is where, to me, we need to facilitate or encourage people to cooperate with each other, you know, to find each other across the network and decide to do something themselves because they want to. Uh, so, in fact, both communities and networks are very much around uh, intrinsic motivation rather than extrinsic motivation. Um, I know my four C models are slightly different from, uh, well, Neil Lusher's presentation fairly recently. Um, uh, he sort of uses cooperation and collaboration differently. Uh, to me, cooperation is is the sort of the peak work style. You know, the most difficult, the most valuable one to get right, uh, because in networks you you can't mandate it, you can't force it. You you have to create the environment where people want to do it. Uh, and you've also got uh, his sort of alpha and beta working, or uh, alpha um, so that um, activity based working over on the right hand side, functions and horizontal teams, uh, and then uh, what I call affinity based working or beta working uh, over on the, the left in communities and networks. 
Um, so we do need to think very deeply about the difference between these groups and within these groups. You know, as I was saying, there are different types of horizontal teams, different types of communities, uh, and we should be thinking uh, about their different needs or from the organisation and from uh, the workplace as well. Um, so just to give you an example of this uh, related to the workplace, uh, this is um, this is based on some work that I did for a client quite early on in the pandemic. Um, so please don't copy this. I'm sure you wouldn't, <laughs> but it was best fit for them, and it is quite dated. So you know, it's it's it. I wouldn't suggest that this is sort of particularly up to speed, uh, up to date with the way things are done now. Um, but I think this sort of um, attempt to analyse and think through and consider and review the different needs of different groups or networks within inside an organisation is absolutely right. You know, much has the potential, well, it's more complicated than saying, okay, let's get everybody in the office for two days, uh, but it's got the potential for much more optimised um, effectiveness, both for the individuals and the business as well. Uh, I should probably explain the uh, column headings as well. Um, so asynchronous technology, that's for me, is things like wikis and collaboration documents and uh, file systems and document libraries and so on that we can sort of use asynchronously. Uh, social technologies are the sort of Microsoft Yammer or um, Fever Engage uh, or uh, Workplace by Meta, etc. Uh, the um, synchronous technology, uh, things that we can use you know, to some extent asynchronously, but expecting a level of, um, of, of a sort of close to synchronous follow up. So things like uh, Teams chat, Slack. Uh, or indeed sort of online um, video conferencing, so Zoom, Team again, t Teams again, etc. Uh, and then obviously the, the small rooms, large rooms, uh, larger spaces, uh, fairly self-explanatory. Uh, and what we try to do here is to sort of work through what the demand for different groups would be. Um, so, uh, yeah, for functions, probably mainly asynchronous technology, because again, people in functions don't really need to work together that closely. Uh, horizontal teams, yeah, definitely synchronous technology or meeting rooms where they can get together. Uh, communities, very reliant on the social aspects of technology. And again, some in-person meetings. Uh, networks, probably the um, asynchronous technology, again, to enable people to find each other, uh, to cooperate with each other. Um, the intent of this matrix, by the way, was to uh, to act as a uh, a basis for for a conversation with different teams to say, look, yeah, you, you're your unique team. We're, we're sure you'll come up with a, a particular unique solution for you. But this is our thinking of sort of what most teams will probably want to do if 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 there are no other reasons for you to do things differently. Um, and that's partly to try to get some sort of consistency and um, alignment across the culture um, and just to make it easier for teams to sort of do their thinking. Uh, there was one example I talked about in this morning's uh, version of this webinar uh, that was pre-pandemic, but um, uh, uh, um, one organisation had a, a team of knowledge managers who were responsible for running facilitated three-day sessions for teams to help those teams explore their objectives, to think about um, uh, uh, team bonding and sort of introduce some of the psychology that teams could use behind that uh, and to think about the use of digital tools, the physical workplace, uh, the communication with other teams and so on. And you could introduce a, a, a matrix like this, just sort of thinking through the, these are how we see different teams working um, into that sort of facilitated session as well. Uh, the other thing I talked uh, to this particular client about uh, was the use of personas, which I've used for a long time. Uh, but here we also thought about group personas, you know, because again, you've got different types of teams. So we were going to have a number of different personas you know, for those different types. So we could get even closer uh, to what the potential demands of different types of group or network would be. Um, okay, so uh, horizontal alignment, including the workplace to get that coherence, uh, vertical alignment to get that best fit opportunity to innovate the organisation. Um, uh, thinking about that horizontal and vertical alignment for groups as well as the organisation as a whole. And my fourth and final insight for you um, 
And it just sort of recognizes uh, that in my experience as a OD practitioner at the very least, uh, it's very rare to find a perfect organization solution for a particular set of needs. Uh, you quite often find, you know, you, you come up with a couple of solutions and this, you know, this organization could be quite centralized and that's got some pros and some cons or it could be decentralized and that's got some pros and cons. And it's not always clear uh, which of those solutions would be uh, the most effective. And um, so this is the tool that I use to support that, uh, which again starts with those uh, objectives that we talked about earlier, the organization capabilities, the workforce needs, and the organization principles. Uh, you could add employee values in there as well, although, as I said, I think it is the principles which are most important in terms of organization and workplace design. Um, and then you can go through a process of divergent thinking, coming up with a number of different options, uh, which firstly means it's more likely that you'll end up with more creative lateral opportunities uh, than you would do if you sort of just go for the, the first obvious solution. Um, and secondly, um, well, it just makes it more likely with a bit more time and a bit more creativity, you'll actually land on uh, what might be the optimal option. Um, so come up with a number of different uh, options or solutions uh, and then compare the pros and cons of each of those back to your objectives. You know, so which of those opportunities best meets what you're trying to achieve? Uh, and that then helps you go into that convergent thinking to actually pick the solution uh, that you're going to move forward with. Um, and then finally, manage the trade-offs. You know, this is something that... Um, organization so many organizations forget uh, or don't haven't sort of thought about even uh, and, and the centralized decentralized organization uh, is, is is the key one uh, that you know there are so many case studies of organizations that have gone through uh, that sort of ongoing oscillation or pendulum swinging moving from uh, centralization to decentralization and back again every couple of years and what tends to happen is that they think okay so Oh, so we need to be centralized. Great, because that's going to make us more efficient. And they know the con of centralization is they don't get so much innovation on the periphery, but they sort of forget about that. So they just do the centralization. And then two years later, they decide, oh, we're not getting very much innovation going on. Oh, we better be decentralized, um, which helps the innovation. But they forget that the con of uh, decentralization is efficiency and they don't do anything about it. So a couple of years later, they decide, oh, we, we need to go back to centralization and so on. And it, it's stupid. It's one of the most stupid things uh, that organizations do. And we do do lots of stupid things. Um, so don't do that. Um, you know, identify the solution and then work out what the, the trade-offs are, you know, the con of the, the best solution you've uh, identified, and then manage, mitigate the con. Um, a workplace design, um, the sort of, Hybrid working, I think, is a great example of this. Um, you know, OK, we're going to be purely remote. Great, because that's got some real benefits. But, you know, let's understand that the con of that uh, is that we will perhaps lose some of that social connection. So let's do something about that. And um, oh, yeah, we, we're now operating globally, so we can't get people in the office two days a week. But perhaps let's all go on holiday together for two weeks every year, or whatever it might be. Um, or, you know, we're going to be fully in the office because that's got some uh, great uh, pros in terms of social connectedness and so on, uh, but we forget about the con of not being able to recruit globally or whatever it might be, and, that, and you know, we don't do anything about it. Um, always focus on managing the trade-off as well. Uh, I think if we do all of that, um, it puts us in a much, much better position uh, to create an effective organization uh, and an effective aligned workplace as well. Uh, right, so that was it. Uh, four insights with you. Uh, obviously, um, the, there's there's a lot more uh, behind those uh, that you can find about in the book, The Social Organization, uh, at the Academy. Um, uh, we're, yeah, and the Academy is for for HR people, so I'm, I'm not really suggesting that for most of you. Um, apart from, um, if you are now convinced or you perhaps always were convinced of the need to for more integration between your uh, in your hr and od people and yourselves and um, yeah please invite them to the academy and um, yeah particularly if they're not doing 
what they should be, perhaps in today's digitally transformed organization. You know, you're doing lots of creative things in the workplace, but the organization seems to be lagging behind it. Uh, please do suggest that they go on the Academy's organization design course and then, you know, they can participate much more effectively uh, in, in, in taking your organization forward. Uh, you've got my LinkedIn uh, contact as well. It'd be wonderful to connect with you. And uh, yeah, hope that's been uh, useful, uh, interesting, insightful, and look forward to your questions. Thank you. Thank you, John. Uh, great insights. And I do have some questions for you. But just to let everyone know, if you could stop sharing, John, that would be great. Just to let everyone know that there will be a follow up email with many of the links that John has talked about with John's slide deck as well. Uh, and some other links that came up following this morning's uh, talk. So they, that will be in an email as well as the recording and the slide deck. So while well, you're getting all this and a lot more. So thank you very much. Sharon, thank you for your question and thank you for the chat along the way. Always great to have you on these events. What would John's advice be to help anyone trying to influence and help top teams to consider rather than need you with the trends? Big question, I know. Um, I, I've got, okay, so I've, I've got a model I call the four T's, uh, which isn't a, a, a wonderful description because they don't all begin with the letter T, um, but it's the best I've come up with. Uh, you can tell, you can explain to them why they need to do that. Um, so buy them my book, a Jay Galbraith book, a, um, uh, a, a Dave Ulrich book. I, I, I don't know who the workplace design author. I'm sure, I'm sure you you know yourselves um, who that might be. Um, or actually, the other uh, book I quite often re recommend is one uh, written by a couple of senior consultants at McKinsey uh, called Beyond Performance, um, which talks about this idea of creating organisational health. Uh, organisational health is those organization capabilities uh, that I talked about before, the human, the organization, the social capital, uh, they use a different term for it, but they are talking about the same thing. Um, and it's written in a very business oriented language. So buy them that book and then book them uh, a, a meeting in their diaries with them a week later to say, I'd like to talk to you about how I can help you create organizational health. Uh, and by the way, can we talk about my uh, salary at the same time? Because uh, by then you'll have demonstrated uh, your value uh, to to the strategic nature of the organization. So that's tell. Um, I'm starting to worry, I'm not going to remember all of these. Um, stealth, just do it under the radar, be strategic, do the stuff. Uh, and then when people come and talk to you and say, what are these strange things you're doing? You can explain, oh, that's strategic HR or OD or workplace design, whatever it may be. Um, oh, blimey, I, I normally get beyond two. Um, um, my mind's gone blank. Oh no, I might have to. I might have to give you those as a link, Mark. Um, okay, don't worry. It's can, can I can I just add something else to it uh, to cover my embarrassment, uh, which is just something that came up in this morning's webinar as well, which is just part of it. I think because the there is a positive to knee jerk responses. You know, you have a a current state need in the organisation. Please do act on it. I'm, I'm not. You know, uh, my encouragement to be strategic doesn't. It shouldn't be taken to suggest that we always need to focus long term, but have that long term picture in mind, you know, and, and the capabilities and the and the principles are a really good way of expressing where you're trying to head. Even whilst understanding that you know, those things are going to change completely well before the time you get there, it's it's, it's still better to, to head towards something, even if it's going to change than just be having a random walk. Um, so have that long term picture. And then you can focus on those short short term uh, opportunities or requirements in a way that translates them from a knee jerk response into something that you need to do now. That's also going to take you towards where you need to go. Hope that's useful. Great. Well, thank thank you very much for that. Kinsey asks, do you see any possibilities for working towards these goals without buy in at top executive level? Yes, uh, but clearly it's a lot more difficult. Um, 
it, 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 it's strange really that a, a lot of my favorite case studies around strategic HR and indeed those organization case studies that I referenced before that are in the various books, so many of them have been led by the chief executive rather than the HR director or the property director or whoever it may be. Um, which is fine, actually. I mean, you know, when I have conversations in HR, I say, look, if you've got a chief executive who's already doing that, who's um, creating competitive advantage through organization capabilities, I mean, in one sense, that's great because you can just be an old traditional transactional HR function and you're not, actually, you know, the business isn't losing out. Uh, I'd, I'd question whether you really want to work in that organization if that's the case, but, you know, you could be. And by the way, there should always be things that you can, you know, even if your chief executive is amazingly strategic and people centric and so on, you know, as professional practitioners, there should always be things that we can add back to them on top of, on, 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 back on top of that. Um, but I, I think the opportunity actually is where you're working for senior leaders who haven't got that perspective. And yes, it's much more difficult, but I don't know. I mean, there's certainly an opportunity or perhaps even an element of fun. I mean, lots of frustration, clearly, but you know, I, I, in the right environment, I think that can provide quite an attractive uh, opportunity as well. Yeah, I think some people thr thrive on frustration, though, because it, it, it kind of drives them on. It really does, doesn't it? Uh, Lorraine, thank you for this question. What do you think are the merits or otherwise? So this is a very topical question of mandating office attendance or leaving that to personal choice subject to organisational need. Huge uh, clickbait in the press at the moment. Yeah, of course. Um, you've got to do something. I mean, just having this idea of, um, you know, we'd like to spend some time in the office, but we don't mind how much or we don't mind when, so that people turn up and, you know, the people they've got to work with aren't in the office at the same time. And that's just not helpful. Um, so I think you need to do something. Um, I think would like everybody in Tuesday to Thursday or whatever it may be, uh, is a easy, certainly um, as a short term response, as a knee jerk response, I think it's fine. Um, I'd have hoped that organisations would have done a bit because we've known that we needed to do some smart thinking for what, three years now. Um, so I'd have hoped we'd sort of progress beyond that by this point. Uh, but if we haven't, let's do that smart thinking now. Um, I think we can do more. And, and, and that was the purpose of sharing that matrix with you. You know, if we start thinking about groups and different demands and so on, I think we can progress beyond that mandate. Um, I will also say, I, um, you know, I, I, I believe passionately that organisations do need to think about creating best fit organisations to meet their own needs, uh, best fit organisations that architectures to meet those organizations needs um and the way you do that as i've explained is through capabilities and principles and so on and therefore actually organizations having different principles is a very good thing you know i, th I think if some organizations say we need five everybody's going to be in the office five days other organizations say everybody's remote other organizations say two days other organizations say well we're not going to worry about that but we're going to do a four-day week all of that is brilliant because it offers more opportunities for all organizations to compete differently and find the workforce who uh, find their particular offer compelling and so on and, and 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 moves us away from best practice which i think is a is is where we need to go so you know and and then you'll find won't you I and mean, if if some organizations say we need everybody in the office 5 days and nobody wants to work in the office 5 days those firms will disappear and we you know, we won't have that issue anymore um so it's it's a sort of an, an, a natural way of ensuring exper experimentation across the the business community. Um, so, I, 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 I suppose my answer is, as long as you've gone through the process of thinking through what are the organisation principles, not just the workforce principles, but the organisation principles for your organisation, if the answer to that thinking is we want everybody in on Wednesday and Thursday, fine as long as you've done the thinking. Yeah, I guess that clarity is really important. And, I, and the thing I keep hearing, and I hear this in the world of HR, it's balance and context, isn't it? It's kind of, it, it's so different from one organization. And uh, I do love, we, we did some research around autonomy and understanding that autonomy is not anarchy. Okay. And autonomy is still freedom within boundaries. So sometimes that structure is is just needed 
Um, I do also, do you think, John, that it's going to be genetically engineering the future workforce as well? In so much as if you don't like it, you'll leave. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, yeah. Um, over time and, um, you know, again, that leads to lots of frustration and difficult situations for particular individuals. But yeah, across the global workforce, that's the way the organizations will evolve. Um, uh, and, and it's difficult to do when all organizations do the same thing because you don't get those experiments. You, you, you don't get that learning um, or things like uh, employer branding. I was saying at the beginning, I spend quite a bit of time on and um, the, 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 the suggestion I make time and time again to employer branding heads is that they can't do anything because the issue isn't their use of social media or telling interesting stories. Yeah, they're doing all of that fine, but actually there's no differentiation in the organization. So what are they trying to communicate? Um, much, much easier. Uh, yeah, absolutely. Clarity. You know, if, if they can have clarity about what type of organization they want to be, they want to be everything else uh, follows much more easily uh, out of that. Yeah, great. And thank you, Paul, for your observation, which is that you found a route to HR by the cross organization well being being program, because that tends to connect the HR and the real estate team very well. And Kinsey, yeah, you highlight the point that I made as long as the organization's willing to accept the consequences of potentially losing valuable talent. And that is, and I think some of them will do that. Um, but Stephanie mentions this, I feel a lot of uh, DEI issues get ignored with a mandated return to the office. As for many people with disability or constraints in the world of work, opened up with remote working and many people are reporting having to quit because of those mandated returns, a very ableist and privileged position to take. Yeah, totally. Um, but yeah, I mean, that's why I suggested look, we need to think through this at the organizational level and the groups and the individual level as well. Um, and I, I didn't spend much time on it here, but you know, the, the LinkedIn newsletter that I referred briefly to on multi sided HR, that's the, um, the, the real complexity of doing a, a more sort of personalized, people centric perspective to HR and OD and the workplace. The, um, you know, 10, 20 years ago, everything was simple because. Uh, again, when I presented OD then, I'd say, well, vertical alignment is about aligning your organization, you know, the 7S or whatever it may be, with your business strategy through the use of organization outcomes. Fine. These days, if we're trying to align with the business strategy, but also our workforce needs, um, well, that, that's double as complex because you, you've got to do two things, but actually it's much more than that because it's not the workforce isn't one entity. You know, you've got as many different people in the workforce as you do have different people. And therefore, instead of just sort of one uh, alignment need, you now have, you know, your the number of employees plus one. So suddenly you've got a, a much, much more complex environment to manage. Um, and I think we are at a very early stage in starting to understand how we can sort of navigate through that paradox and come up with organizations that work as much as possible for everybody. And um, yeah, I mean, you mentioned earlier, you know, the idea of balance, which I think is good. Um, but paradox is about, you know, finding ways to try to um, meet all of the needs, not, not, not to sort of compromise between them. You know, so the business wants to do this, the individual wants to do that. Let's find a compromise. Let's find a way that enables, you know, everybody to be as effective as possible, which isn't easy, but I think is a worthwhile struggle. Um, yeah, so, you know, how can we ensure the business is effective, the teams and networks work effectively, you know, and this individual who's, you know, the start of their career needs lots of mentoring, you know, they need that support in the office and this other individual who, you know, has difficulty traveling, you know, is, is able to work at home because that's what they need. And it's combining all of that somehow uh, artfully. And it's, 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 it's a really difficult thing to do, but again on balance and, and for some organizations the right answer might be two days in the office uh, across organizations as a whole you know that cannot be the right solution because it, it is just a compromise it's not uh it's not a, a it's it's not an optimal solution for, for for anything it's not optimal for the business not optimal for the groups not optimal for the individuals uh so we, yeah, we should be trying to get beyond that 
yeah, I, I, I think that's overused but one size doesn't fit all. And I think that's the problem with mandates. It makes that decision. And the biggest thing I think every organization has is knowing their people. And that's one of those really easy things to say, but it's difficult, but not impossible. So uh, really, John, I've loved this. It's uh, three minutes to the hour and I've gone over two minutes like I like to say. John, thank you very much for a fantastic session. Just to let everyone know, uh, do join us for our follow-up uh, webinars, and uh, you, if you're interested in DEI, &E you'll enjoy next month's uh, session with Julian Burgess-Smith. Uh, thank you very much for joining us, everyone online, and especially a big thank you to John. And if you click to the chat, you'll see the thank yous coming in now. So thank you very much for joining us. Thank you, everyone.